Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen. And I'm Barry Strom, your host. I'll be doing the channeling of our wonderful spirit guest tonight. I'm Connie Strom, your co-host, and I would also like to welcome you to our show. Last week, we investigated the history of human advancement by channeling the spirits of Greek philosopher Socrates, Roman philosopher and emperor Marcus Aurelius, and modern psychologist Sigmund Freud. It was a really stimulating intellectual discussion. The show is available on our YouTube channel. It's in the name of Barry Strom and has over 625 videos at this point. We are currently consolidating all of our audio broadcasts on a new platform named podbean.com that gives us access to platforms such as Alexa, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Safari, and many others. Just go to the site and search Barry Strom. This weekend, we celebrate Memorial Day, a time that we honor those that have served the country and those that made the final sacrifice for us. Since the founding of our country, almost 1.2 million troops have died in the service of our country. Today, we're going to channel the spirits of three generals that have led our forces during major wars. Ulysses Grant, during the Civil War, John Pershing, the Army General during World War I, and Dwight Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in World War II. Okay, so let's do a short disclaimer, and then we're going to get on with the show. The opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits and do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or those of our sponsors. And additionally, before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. Connie's now going to say the prayer, and we'll begin to channel with this wonderful spirit guest that we have tonight. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Okay, let's start with speaking with the spirit of Ulysses Grant. He graduated from West Point in 1843 served in the Mexican-American War, and then became a general in the American Civil War. After leading several successful Union campaigns in the western part of the country, he was promoted to Lieutenant General, and for 13 months fought Confederate General Robert E. Lee until obtaining victory at Appomattox. He was elected president in 1868. General Grant, I know you've been with us many times before, and we thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, General. Uh, would you like to begin with a message this evening? Yes, I would. I watched as many brave boys gave their lives for what they thought was the right thing to do. The Civil War was a terrible, terrible thing. Brothers truly did fight brothers, and hundreds of thousands of the boys died. I was chosen as a leader to try to defeat the Confederacy, and by defeating them, defeating them to end this terrible conflict that I was involved in. Today, today your boys are keeping the world peace. The military of the country is an incredible force. As I watched through the years as the military increased and became stronger, I truly cannot believe exactly what 
is taking place. You now have weapons that can destroy the world. And that is very, very sad. In my day, we could destroy many lives, but we had nothing comparable to what we see today. So I thank you for allowing me to come through. I know you have questions for me, and I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you, General. Nearly 600,000 military personnel died during the Civil War. What was it like to participate in such a war? It was devastating. There were times that even I was sickened by the carnage. It's impossible to have you lose your, to lose friends and not feel great grief. I felt sorry for both sides. And as you know, in our war, we were supposed to kill as many of the other side as we could. We became quite effective at it. The artillery would destroy their bodies. We would charge, there would be hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It was, it was almost incomprehensible. The armies in those days were huge and we would put thousands of soldiers into, into a battle at a time. It was the first time that we had really tested much of our weaponry. The artillery of the day was very primitive compared to today's weapons. But when we fired double canister and you would watch 20 to 30 of the enemy of their line fall out, you knew that you had just wrecked the lives of all those families. Yeah, what was it like to give orders that you knew would result in the death of perhaps thousands of soldiers? It was, it was very difficult. I knew that we had to win the war. I knew that the war was very difficult. I knew that if we didn't, the Union was not going to survive. And I felt very strongly that we should be one nation under God. The people living in the South, they felt that their way of life was being destroyed and they wanted to have a country of their own. President Lincoln felt very strongly that that was not to be the case. And I felt strongly as well. I knew that I would, every time I was giving orders to begin a battle, that I was ordering boys to die. I felt very strongly about it, but I also had a very deep belief in God. And I felt that perhaps they would truly be going to a better place. The war was terrible. It was one of the worst that our country has ever been involved in. And hopefully we never get involved with another that was so devastating. Why did the Civil War have such a high mortality rate? At the time, we were emulating European style of fighting. We had cavalry, we had artillery, and we would, especially at the beginning of the war, we would line our soldiers up in lines and we would have reserve lines behind the, the initial line of, of attack. And we would simply charge across open fields. The artillery could destroy many. Those that did live through the artillery would charge the line with their bayonets. They may get to fire their weapons. It was basically that we were using the wrong techniques. As the war progressed, we became more inclined to use trenches. But the only way to overrun a trench was to have our boys charge from the open and try to attack those that were in the trenches at the time. We did not have the modern tactics that we had today. Today, forces can lay off. 
they can be great distances from each other. It is in our day it was fighting was so much more personal. It was it was just simply a terrible time. The losses were phenomenal. You would see battlefields where you could hardly walk without stepping upon a dead body. But it was the way we were taught. It was the way that we commanded the troops to fight. And they fought, sadly. It turned out that it was very, very deadly on the boys. Sir, what do you think is the primary characteristic that results in humans fighting wars? I think that the primary characteristic is greed. Without greed, the people that lead the countries would not try to gain other, other properties. They would not try to instill their way of life on others. It's a free will. The free will makes it very dangerous. And if people do not make the proper decisions, then free will truly acts counter to what God wants individuals to act. War is the opposite of love. There's no other way around it. Do you see any hope that humans will stop fighting wars? Maybe far into the future. What I see now as we watch from the other side are great hatreds between many different, many different countries, many different nationalities, many different races. There are so many reasons that people are using to hurt others. Countries want more land when they have so much. They want the natural resources. They want many things from others that they do not have. It's very sad to watch what human nature has become. The younger generations are taught hatred. And as long as that takes place, hatred will continue because those young people truly become the leaders of tomorrow. That is true. What is your opinion of our current military? As I watch from over here, I think that the military of the United States is the strongest military in the world. Huge amounts of money are spent on the military. They have weapons far beyond the imagination. They have secret weapons that people are not aware of, nor should they be. They truly have the ability to win any war anywhere in the world. Hopefully nobody challenges them, because if they do, it is going to be a very, very difficult time for the challenging country. Would you make any changes to our current military if you were in charge? Yes. I would. I would try to make the military more attractive for the young men and women of the country to serve. I would try to make the military as strong as possible with the funds that are available. I would put more money into space warfare. No matter what the agreements say, there are other countries that are preparing weapons to fight in space. Today, many of your modern weapons are dependent upon what you refer to as GPS. The guidance systems, I think, in your satellites are probably one of the most vulnerable areas for the military at this time. I think if a true world war breaks out, the first thing that the other countries will do will be to attack our satellites, and our tracking systems. More attention has to be paid to that aspect of the military. Now that you're on the other side, do you see soldiers that died under your command? And if yet so, how do they react to your presence? Yes, we regularly see people that, that served under me that were killed. Many of them, many of them are very much in still in awe of being close to the person that commanded them in, in the war. 
generally the boys that were killed in war were treated with very good judgments when they arrived. They are truly in a better place. Once you're in heaven and you look back at your life as a human, you understand just how much better it is. Jesus spoke the truth when he said that heaven was a far better place. And most of the boys that I talk to over here are very happy. They're with their other family members. And many of them are thinking about coming back at some time. But it's such a wonderful place. And it's actually a great joy to speak with the boys that I served with. If you had to do over, would you make any changes in how you commanded your troops? Yes. I would have been more careful. I pushed the Confederates as hard as I could push them. I think there were times that I should have used more fin finesse. There were times that I made severe mistakes in char ordering charges where I should not have done it. Cold Harbor, for instance, was a mistake that I made that cost many boys their lives. I think that I should have had more scouts. I think that I should have relied upon, upon some of my instincts, but the president wanted me to push as hard as I could, and that is what I did. Are you planning to reincarnate? I'm definitely thinking about it. There will be times in the future that I think that some of my talents, if I go back, decide to stay in the military, that they could be quite valuable. How were you judged when you returned to heaven? They pointed out to me that there were times that I was more brutal than I should have been. There were times that I, my actions took civilian lives that I should not have done. But I also was the commander that saved the Union and kept the United States united. So basically, I was... I was pretty well and fairly judged. Okay. What do you see as the future of wars? I see the future of wars as actually diminishing as the power of weapons increase. You will reach a point where your weapons are so strong that other countries would have to be almost insane to attack. In a fashion of which you are accustomed. Other countries will try to undermine the population of countries. They will lie. They will use propaganda. Cyber warfare will be huge. And you will see much going on in space. As I say, the first line of attack will eventually become your satellites. Do you think there will ever be another civil war in the United States? No, I do not believe that. I think that compromise will come before civil war when there is great difficulties in the country. Okay. What do you think is the best way to honor our soldiers on Memorial Day? Attend a Memorial Day parade. Go to a military cemetery. Look at all the grave sites and pray to God that wars cease to exist. Pray to God that these young boys that sacrificed their lives have found eternal peace in heaven. Meditate and truly understand the sacrifices that all of these individuals have done. General, thank you so much for joining us again. Did you have a final message for our listeners? Yes. The military is what keeps you safe. It's what gives you your freedoms that you have today. There are people today that are trying to tear apart the military. There are internal forces that are trying to defeat what your enemies through the years have not been able to do. Respect the fact that over a million individuals have given their lives so that you can have the freedoms that you have today. Encourage the young to join the military. Enjoy encourage those that are great leaders 
to actively participate in the military. Have strong leaders run for your political offices and whatever you do, do not weaken the military. The world has many, many enemies that would love to see the United States and the other democracies subservient to them. So thank you for allowing me to speak. I truly appreciate the opportunity. And we appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your thoughts. John J. Pershing was born in 1860 and died in 1948. He served as the commander of the American Expe Expeditionary Forces during World War I in the Philippines, as well as leading the U.S. forces in pursuit of the Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa. He was a graduate of West Point also. He was one of the first white officers to command an all-black regiment. So, General, thank you so much for joining our party tonight. Uh, would you like to begin with a message? Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. This is the first opportunity that I have had, and I truly appreciate it. I commanded our forces in the First World War. The First War was terrible. It was trench warfare. It was brutal beyond any imagination. Many civilians were killed. Hundreds of thousands of members of the military were killed. The, the air forces were very primitive but they learned how to, how to drop bombs before the end of the war. Gas. For the first time in recorded history, the armies used mustard gas that ate out the lungs of the soldiers. So many were maimed. So many had their lives destroyed. It lasted for years. It seemed as though there was never going to be an answer to it. It was, it was simply a terrible time in world history. Yes, nearly 117,000 members of the military died during World War I. Uh, would you like to expand on what it was like to participate in that? It was carnage beyond anything that you can believe. As commander, I basically was in the rear areas, but I saw the effects. The boys, the wounded, the ones that could, there were that had their lungs burned, the ones that were spitting the blood, the ones that were dying because there, we had nothing we could do for them. Keep in mind that we did not have the antibiotics that you have today or a lot of the medical techniques. Artillery was playing an absolute huge role. Both sides were firing as many rounds as they could at the other side. If you ever saw a direct hit from an artillery shell, you will. It is something that you would never forget. It was, it was like the ultimate example of brutality and cruelty among man. Yeah, more individuals actually died of sickness than of combat. How is that possible? In 1918, there was a great flu epidemic. The boys in their camps and on the ships were in close contact with each other. When one became infected, it was almost inevitable that they would, that many would become infected. To be in those trenches was terrible. Often they were in water all the time. It was cold. The winters were nasty. To fight in those trenches was just a horrendous situation. Sickness was everywhere. And the wounds were so critical, and there was a shortage of doctors to take care of them. The brutality created infection among when when individuals were wounded. There was generally they would, their wounds would become infected. The only way to stop it would be to amputate the limbs internal infections we had problems fighting that as well but the flu the influenza was the hidden killer of the war 
What do you think is the primary characteristic that results in humans fighting wars? I know that General Grant said that it was that it was human greed, and I would have to agree with him. But there are the thirst for power. It is always the political leaders that get the common person involved in war. Political leaders often have false concepts of what is really important. They wanted to take additional lands. In the case of World War I, the death of Archduke Ferdinand was the excuse for the trigger. But the countries had not been getting along before. There were disputes, border arguments. Individuals and countries just seem to not understand the concept of coexistence. There will always be a bully. There are always people that think they are stronger than others. And if those people turn to warfare, you have these great wars. Do you see any hope that humans will stop fighting wars? I fear they will not any time in the foreseeable future. Currently, the world is involved in many, many conflicts. I am not even sure how many countries are fighting with other countries at this time. Political instability is now a weapon that is used by other countries. Propaganda. At the present time, you do not know what is true and what is not. The countries lie to their people and they have people become enraged and then the people want to fight the other countries. Perhaps the best example I can give you is the Russians calling the Ukrainians Nazis. Russia lost millions of people fighting Germany and the Nazi regime. And the people were naive, are naive enough to believe the current Russian leaders when they lie about the people of the Ukraine. But it works to stir up animosities and the people become enraged and they support the military to fight in those countries. You find today that even the common person, many of them in Russia, support the atrocities that are taking place. And this is because of the propaganda that they are fed. What is your opinion of our current military? In most aspects, I am very, very proud of our current military. They are strong. They are doing much research in areas where research needs to be done. They have some of the greatest weapons in the world. But there are also people in the military that are trying to weaken it. There are people that are thinking that certain weaknesses should be allowed in the military. We have some of the best combat forces and best trained in the world. But because of some of the policies, many of the young people do not want to join the military. Changes have to be made to attract the young. You do not want to get into a situation where the young have to be drafted. An army of volunteers is always much more effective than an army of draftees. What changes would you make to the military? I would raise the pay of the military. I would raise the benefits if anything would happen to the members. I would make sure that there was insurance in place that would provide enough benefits if the member was killed. I would increase the number of hospitals and I would make medical care much more available, especially in remote areas of the country. I would do everything that I could think of to make the military not only stronger, but more attractive for young people to serve. Good thoughts. Now that you're on the other side, do you see soldiers that died under your command? And if so, how do they react to your presence? Absolutely. 
Some of the soldiers that died under my command are the spirits that I see most over here. They were wonderful soldiers. And over here, there is this great equality. There is no evil over here. There can be some dislike, but there is no hatred. I am very honored to be able to be with those that followed my commands. Many of them lived and many of them passed, but it is an honor to be with them one, one more time. If you had it to do over, would you make any changes to how you commanded your troops? If it would, if I would have had time, if I would make any changes, it would be in how I handled moving the troops in such confined quarters that many of them received the flu. Most of the soldiers that got sick were not able to fight to their fullest extent when they arrived. I would have used smaller ships and I would have not have pushed as hard. I think that we should have got into the, started sending our boys over earlier. If we would have gotten involved in the war earlier, the flu would not have had such a great effect upon us. What do you think differentiates World War I from the other World War? I think the mass brutality, the, the trench warfare. There were very brutal battles in, in the Second World War, as we all know. But gas was not utilized. Gas was a terrible, terrible weapon. In the beginning, we were not prepared to defend against it. Once we got the, the procedures and the gas masks and everything in place, we at least had some defense. But when they first used it, it was a horrible weapon to which there was no defending. I think the use of, of the gas is probably the biggest differences between the two. And World War II made massive use of aviation and bombing. That was obviously not available to us in World War I. Yeah. Do you see the end of any wars for the U.S.? Sadly, I don't. There are so many countries that hate the United States and the other democracies. I do not see war ending anytime soon. Who do you think represents the greatest threat to the U.S. today? Russia. I think their nuclear weapons create a great threat, but in the long term, I think that it is China and possibly Iran. If Iran gets the nuclear weapon, they will use it. They, they, they're, the way they pursue Islam, it is almost a command that they should use it to kill Christians. Terrible. What's your opinion of Putin and Russia? I think Putin is a psychopath, and I think that he has absolutely no conscience and that he will stop at nothing. It will not be until Putin and whoever replaces him understands that in order to get along in the world, Russia must make radical changes. What do you think is the best way to honor our soldiers on Memorial Day? I think that everyone should pray that all of the soldiers that have served us in the past have found peace in heaven. I think they should show honor to the country. I think they should take time and just simply go to some of the military cemeteries to under the true scope of the sacrifices. Once you go to Arlington, you will never forget it. That is true. I've been there. Then thank you so much for joining us this evening. Do you have a final message for our listeners? Yes. First of all, this is the first time I've been able to speak since I've been on this side. So thank you very much for the opportunity. The democracies of the world today have got to maintain their status as leaders of the world. Communism, socialism, that type of government can never succeed. The sheer brutality of what those countries do to their people, how they fight their wars, they have got to learn that that is not the way in which they can exist in the modern world. Countries must band together to stop them. 
My first choice would be economic sanctions to stop these countries. If they cannot afford to pay their people to live properly, then they cannot exist. The first way to beat them is economically. Today, the United States relies on China in so many ways. You have got to end that reliance, and China has got to be on its own and not be a leader in world trade. Iran, you may need to have to forcibly go in and destroy their weapons. Sadly, there is no easy path in today's world. But I thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to speak and say a prayer for all the boys that have passed. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate your input. Okay. Dwight Eisenhower was a graduate of West Point, where he graduated in 1915. World War One ended just before he was scheduled to go to Europe to fight. He attended the Command and General Staff College, graduating first in his class, served as a military aide to General Pershing, and later to General Douglas MacArthur. In 1943, he was appointed Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in, U in Europe and spearheaded the planning of the Normandy invasion, which consisted of over 150,000 troops in that operation. He was elected president in 1952. President Eisenhower, you've been with us before. Thank you for honoring us and welcome back. Yes, thank you for coming back, Mr. President. Would you like to begin with a message this evening? Yes, I would. I tried to serve my country as best I could. I wanted to be in the military. I wanted to be among the men that defended the country. I especially wanted to be able to lead. I was very blessed by God. He led me to West Point. He led me to be able to advance in the military. I got to know General Pershing and served as an aide to him. I got to know General MacArthur and I was with him for over four years in the Philippines. God blessed my path. I think that he understood that I was going to, at some point in my life, play a true role, a large role in the future of the war of the second, what was to be known as the Second World War. It is very difficult to lead men. I grew up in the country. I understood what it was like to love those that were around me. I had a wonderful wife. We lost a child at a very early age, so I knew what the absolute grief of using a child was. I was well aware that each person, each soldier or sailor or member of the Air Force that was killed represented a devastation to the family unit that he left behind. When you take that devastation and you multiply it by hundreds of thousands, you start to get a reality. But you also know that there is an enemy that wants to not only destroy all of our servicemen, but to conquer the world, to take over our country, to assure that freedoms for others in the world do not exist. So the way you have to think about it is the end is by the end result. If the enemy wins, they will probably execute all of our soldiers anyway. So you cannot allow them to win. You must defeat them 
and sadly you must kill them. That is the only way that a war will end. The person that kills the most of the soldiers will win the war. That is a sad fact. This has been a reality for mankind since their creation. They have killed others to obtain what they want. And the others have had to defend themselves to maintain what they want. Humans haven't changed. That is the same thing is going on today. I'm very, very saddened as I watch. I thought that the Cold War with Russia was over. I thought that the Russian people would be able to take over and trade with the rest of the free world. I thought that they would be able to coexist with the other countries. But sadly, the lies that the people were told in Russia have misled them once more, and they are once again living under a dictator. I dealt with them. During the war, they were our allies. After the war, they were our enemies. I understand Russia probably more than any other soul can understand them. They are a very, very difficult country to deal with. Traditionally, they have not been trustworthy. They have broken all of their agreements with other countries, and they have not hesitated to try to expand their borders. So that was a bit drawn out, but I thank you so much, and I am ready to answer your questions. Might have been a bit drawn out, but it was all excellent information. There was a total of over 405,000 military fatalities in World War II. What is it like to assume commanding command knowing that your orders will lead to the death of thousands of individuals? What you have to believe in your mind is that your leadership will save lives. In war, it is inevitable that lives will be taken. But if you are a good leader, you will minimize the number of deaths of the people under your command. The weapons of World War II were very effective killing instruments. For the first time in history, we had command of weapons in the air that could bomb, that could strafe, that could attack the enemy in many different ways. I told myself that somebody had to take command, and I felt that I was the best person to do it in the European theater. I felt that I could save lives, and it was that thought that got me through the hardest of times. What would you say is the primary characteristic that results in humans fighting wars? Greed and hatred, mostly hatred. The leaders of a country will lie to the people and create hatreds. Once that hatred is great enough, the people will fight. They will try to destroy those that they hate. Common sense at some point means nothing. And sadly, today we're seeing the point that hatred has taken over. Do you see any hope that humans will stop fighting wars? No. Humans have been fighting wars since they first walked the earth. Humans have fought wars that have destroyed civilizations. I do not really see any way that humans will change in the near future. There may be a time that they understand that the, the total brutality will only result in the end of their evolution, but it will not be until they come to the realization that the only way to advance into the future is to coexist with their neighbors. You are correct. What is your opinion of our current military? I'm very proud of the current military. I think that in certain areas, they are striving for a type of political correctness that will hurt the military, but they have the strongest weaponry in the world. We have the best fighters. 
We have the greatest everything. What we need to do is advance more in our space weaponry. We have to face the fact that others will fight us in space and that with the modern technologies, we are very vulnerable in certain areas, but we have the greatest military in the world. What changes would you make to our current military if you were in charge? I would try to make it a place that people would would join in order to make a career of it. It's very difficult because it is, there are times it's very difficult being in the military, especially at times of war. But I would instill this great patriotism. Love of country is the most important thing that people can have. Love of country will lead individuals to serve the country and to make the decision that is best for the people. It is a time that individuals must acknowledge the military as the only way that the country will continue to exist. Yeah. Now that you're on the other side, do you see soldiers that died under your command? And if so, how do you, they react to your presence? I see many, many people that have died following my orders. It makes me very sad when I first see their presence, but they are always very happy to see me. They are people that have served. They are people that have died and they are people that have known the true patriotism of the ultimate sacrifice for their country. They still honor my presence when I'm around them and I honor them. Some of them are my best friends over here. If you had it to do over, would you make any changes to how you commanded your troops? I would make some minor changes. I think that even though the Normandy invasion was ultimately successful, we lost a lot of boys that we did not need to lose. I think that we should have probably done probing actions to try to draw out the true locations of the weapons instead of trying to surprise them. I think there are things we could have done to lessen the fatalities of the war. We made some bad decisions. Sometimes I took the advice of other leaders that I should not have taken. I should have followed my own instincts. We got involved in certain operations that involved a high loss of life that we should not have done. We should have anticipated the Battle of the Bulge where we lost many boys. But yes, there are things, but all in all, I believe that I did a pretty good job. I believe a lot of people would agree with that. If you had it to do over, what changes would you make in your presidency? That is a very interesting question. I was at the height of the Cold War. We did many things that we probably shouldn't have done, and we did, we did not do things that we should have done. We should have done more to destroy the economy of Russia. They spent huge amounts of money on their military, and Ultimately, that is part of what defeated their country. We brought as much pressure as we thought we could, and we contained them. I did some things that were undercover, that were possibly not what my Congress wanted me to do, but I fought as a soldier. I governed as a person that had been in the military. And at least we did not have a violent war break out. Russia did grow stronger. And I think that we should have possibly sabotaged some of their raw material facilities, but it was a very difficult situation and we did the best we could do. As you just said, you were president during the Cold War. What do you think about Russia today? 
I think that we're back to the same thing we saw in my time. Russian leadership has lied to the people, and the people of Russia haven't heard the truth for four generations. Russia today is extremely dangerous because they have the nuclear weapons. If they did not have nuclear weapons, they could be defeated in two weeks. But it is the fear of their fear, and you have a psychotic president that you do not really know what will do. So Russia, Russia is like a maniac in an asylum. The asylum is the country of Russia at this time, and the maniac is Putin. Okay, do you see any way to end the Russian-Ukraine war? Support Ukraine in any way that we can do it. Give them the weapons they need, allow them to strike into Russia. If Russia uses a nuclear weapon, hit them with, with a strike that will convince them that they best not ever do it again. If they use multiple nuclear weapons, then we must use our nuclear weapons in response. What country do you consider the greatest threat to the U.S. today? Today it could possibly be, be, be Russia because of the massive nuclear weapons. In the long term, I think it's China. China wants to rule the world. Somehow or other, the Chinese people have got to be convinced that what is taking place is not right for them. China is extremely powerful, and the communist state controls the people. They have to feed the people, and as their population grows, it will become more difficult. But China wants to rule the world. China must be isolated. People need to bite the bullet and stop trading with them. China needs to be isolated until communism falls. Yeah. Are you planning to reincarnate? And if so, do you think you'll come back to be part of the military? I'm thinking about it. I love the militaries. I've had prior lives in militaries, and it is kind of what I do. So I do think that I might choose to return sometime in the near future. The future for the United States is quite shady at this time, and I think that they will need leadership in the future. I hope you do. Would you ever come back to be a politician? Hell no. <laughs> I didn't want to be president, but that's the way things worked out. I did the best I could as president, but as I watch the hatred that people shower upon your current presidents, the terrible lives that they have to live, the pressures that they're under, I think I would just simply rather be in the military. What do you believe is the best way to commemorate Memorial Day? I think that the best way to do it is to go out, watch the local parades, cheer for the veterans as they come by, but meditate. Sit back and think about all of the boys that have died so that you can have the lifestyle that you're currently living. Without the military, you would not be living the way you are living. You might be speaking German, you might be speaking Japanese, or you may be speaking some other language. The military is all that has saved the country. Without the military, the people, the innocents of the country would be defenseless. There are people that are trying to undermine the military today. Your enemies know the secret to trying to defeat the United States comes from within. The United States will not be defeated from outside because of the power of the military. But if they can undermine the people, if they can undermine the politicians, if they can get people elected to office that want to diminish the size and the strength of the military, then the United States can be defeated. You have to understand that the only way the country will be to be defeated is from within. Thank you, sir. I agree with you 100%. Do you have a final message for us? Yes. I always enjoy being able to speak with the two of you and being able to speak with your listeners. I did all that I could for my country. 
I truly loved it. I loved the people of the country and I loved the members of the military, the Air Force, the Navy. During my time, I had to make decisions that took the lives of many, many young individuals. It was very difficult to make those decisions, but they had to be made. You always have to look at the greater good and the greater good is anything that strengthens the way of life of the countries. The greater good is knowing God. I always knew God. I always knew that I could ask in prayer for answers. Sometimes I would have external influence that would make me not pay attention to my instincts. And sometimes I made mistakes. But I always knew that I could pray and receive answers. I always knew that God was with us and was with the democracies of the world. So pray to God that all of the soldiers that are currently serving are protected and under his arm. Pray that we do not have a major conflict where our boys have to get involved. Pray that the evil countries of the world fail and cease to exist. So thank you so much for allowing me to come through once again. Goodbye and have a wonderful Memorial Day. Thank you so much, to the sir. In fact, all three of you, your wonderful souls in our country was very fortunate to have you living a life in our country. Okay, thanks so much, guys. That was incredible. My 10th book, Messages of the Archangels, is now available for purchase. You can buy it in paperback, hardcover, video book, and ebook on Amazon. Signed copies are on my website. It's barrystrom.com. That's barrystrom.com. I hope that you enjoyed the show tonight. I know that it was very special. And I hope that you have a great Memorial Day. Go out to the military cem cemeteries and look at the grave sites. You'll think differently. I'd also like to thank you for joining us tonight on Channeling History. This week we tried to bring you conversations with three of the greatest United States generals as part of our effort to commemorate Memorial Day. So please take a moment and say a prayer for all that have died so that we have our, the freedoms that we celebrate. Barry and I have been trying to bring you the truth about history by speaking to the souls that lived the events, because it's the only by understanding the events of the past that we can prepare properly for the future. So God bless you all. Okay, all of our shows are available on our YouTube channel. <clears throat> There's over 625 of them. It's in channels in my name, Barry Strom. And it's a, but the easiest way to download them is go to Podbean. Bean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com. And just simply search Channeling History. The downloads are free and very easy. All our other shows are available for download. Everything is there. Um, our Wednesday shows, our Sunday shows. We hope you enjoy our show tonight. Thank you so much for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. Telling history. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com.